breaking news right now. Tragedy strikes a Metro Atlanta family. A two year old boy dead from gunfire inside his own home. We're piecing it how it all went down. We also have major developments involving Georgia's election. We're one step closer tonight to ending all of that drama. But first, Check this out. Snow flurries in North Georgia. Storm tracker Jill Davies sent us this video from Blairsville. And this is also from a storm tracker. Trish Peters, also from Blairsville. Our chief meteorologist Chris Holcomb joins us with the cold hard facts. Yeah, we see just a little bit of that moisture with the cold air coming in, squeezing out of the atmosphere, and that's why we had a few of those flurries a little bit earlier. Right now, no additional reports of any of that new precip coming in. You can see some of that that was up in North Georgia. That's where most of those reports have been coming in. In fact, it was enough snow. This picture from Timothy Garrett in Hiawassee, enough that he could write a message in there with first snow 11, 15, 18. But this is what I want you to see here. This is from Sharon Dunn in Jasper showing some of the glazing on her deck there. Now any moisture that is left behind from all of the rain that we have had here over the past few days, most of this is drying up, but anything that is left behind has the potential to freeze and cause some black ice. In fact, there's a freeze warning in effect for all of North Georgia, uh, Metro Atlanta, even south of Macon with those temperatures dropping to 30 to 33 degrees. So here's the deal. If you're out tonight or early in the morning and driving and you see something that looks wet, you need to assume that that could be slick or black ice. We'll tell you when all of that will melt and when we'll totally dry out and see the sun. More on that coming up. All right, Chris, we'll see you in a couple of minutes, sir. Right now, big news about our contentious election. Gwinnett County has finally certified the results, the last Georgia County to do so. Stacey Abrams cut into Brian Kemp's lead by only 165 votes. That's far short of what she needs for a runoff. She still trails by more than 54,000 votes. In the 7th Congressional District, Carolyn Bardot has cut into Rob Woodall's lead, but still trails by more than 400 votes. Bardot campaign can request a recount, and they tell us that they're still deciding what step to take next. Let's get some reaction right now from Ashley Johnson. She is live in Lawrenceville. Well, Ron, certainly a night of mixed reactions. The head of the Board of Elections for the county believes they've done everything in their power to make sure the process is fair. But there are those doubters. After tallying the ballots, not much has changed since the original count. The Democratic candidate for Georgia's 7th District, Carolyn Bordeaux, filed a lawsuit against the county, claiming officials tossed absentee ballots for, trivi for trivial reasons. A judge ruled those ballots be recounted. I want everybody to understand that. This is, I'm going to get emotional about this, y'all. Voting sacred, and we don't take this lightly. This is very, very serious stuff, so I want you to understand that everybody up here, whether I agreed or disagreed with them, and there, believe me, there were some disagreements, that at the end of the day, every person up here did what they thought was the right thing to do. Now, the next step is for the state to certify the elections. Ron? All right, thanks a lot, Ashley. You're absolutely right, and that state certification by state law must happen by Tuesday, and it could happen as soon as tomorrow. I'm Ryan Kruger. Happening right now, authorities are trying to figure out if the parents of a two-year-old boy who accidentally shot and killed himself will be facing charges. It happened when both parents were asleep at their home in Jonesboro. That toddler climbed into bed. This happened shortly after noon today at a home on the 300 block of Black Hawk Trail. Now tonight, I stopped by the home. The family was devastated. Many neighbors, loved ones were there trying to rationalize what happened. Clayton County police tell us a gun was placed underneath the pillow on the bed, and when the two-year-old climbed on top, he grabbed the gun. His dad was sleeping in the bed, his mom sleeping on the couch. That is when that two-year-old fired one shot, which ultimately took the boy's life. It's very devastating to the family and for the investigators, the emergency personnel that respond. So we always encourage everyone, if you have small children, anybody that can get access to a firearm, that you use a necessary precautions to keep that firearm safe. Sadly, we've heard that advice before. Sadly, we've covered these tragic stories before. Police tell us the family is cooperating with their investigation. Once police are done, they're going to hand over the Thank results you. to the district attorney's office, who will decide if the parents will be facing any charges. 
I'm Natisha Lance. Well, we have been pushing South Fulton police for answers on their pursuit policy for four days now. This comes after an officer crashed into a van while chasing another car. Three people inside that van Crash is under investigation by the Georgia State Patrol. Now, when the investigation is complete, South Fulton Police will then conduct their internal investigation. And tonight we caught up with the chief of police from South Fulton to find out their. We do have a pursuit policy in South Fulton about 10 pages long. We haven't received it right. as of yet, but can you just lay out a little bit what that pursuit policy details? Well, we want to make sure that we use a due regard anytime we um, engage in any sort of um, a car chase. And so certainly that's a, a huge part of that. And we want to make sure that we're educating our officers to a much higher degree when it comes to uh, our chase policy. Okay, and at this point, based on that chase policy, does, this, does it appear as if the officer was abiding by that? I think it's I think it's a little premature to speculate on that. As I said, it'll be predicated on the outcome of the investigation itself. Now they haven't given us a timeline as to when the investigation will be completed. The officer involved in that crash was treated at the hospital and then released, but investigators are having a much tougher time identifying the three victims who were in that crash and family members of those victims are believed to live out of the country, so they'll have to give DNA in order to help with identification, Ron. All right, Natisha, thanks a lot. Investigators say a Georgia native could could be the most prolific serial killer in the history of our country after admitting to more than 90 murders across the United States. 78 year old Samuel Little claims his murder spree spanned 13 states over 35 years. Little is now serving time in Texas for murder and recently shared details about dozens of other killings that only the murderer would know. APD is now working to confirm if Little is in fact linked to any crimes in Atlanta. It's one of the top trending stories right now. Model and actress Kim Porter found dead today in her Los Angeles home. Porter was the former girlfriend of hip hop mogul Diddy. She was 47 years old. The FDA is taking first steps towards banning menthol in cigarettes. It's an attempt to control skyrocketing teenage tobacco use. The FDA says more than half of the teen smokers use menthols. A ban on menthol will likely take years to become reality and face a fight from the tobacco companies. And just in time for the holiday season, gas prices are on the decline. AAA says the national average for a gallon of gas is $2.68. A dramatic drop in oil prices over the last few weeks is fueling a dip in the cost of gas. And Atlanta police say they finally captured one of their top 10 most wanted suspects, but we wanted to know what qualifies you to be on that top 10. Got him. Officers say they needed to get this guy, 25-year-old Rufus Hurst, off the streets. Atlanta PD say he's been on their top 10 most wanted list since February of 2017. Hurst is accused of pointing a gun at his victim and hijacking their car. But we wanted to know what qualifies Hurst to be on the top 10 most wanted in Atlanta. There are possibly hundreds of wanted suspects on the run out there. Why Hurst? Police say here are the qualifiers to be on the most wanted list. It depends on the type of crime committed, whether it's a violent offender, the number of crimes a suspect may be linked to, and the extreme difficulty hunting the suspect down. Officers say they checked all the boxes off to put Hearst on the most wanted list. And here are the other most wanted still on the lam. They should be considered armed and dangerous and not approachable. Call 911 if you see them and let the professionals handle their business. You know, there's a case of a little girl kidnapped, raped and murdered, has stumped investigators for more than 40 years now. Yeah, and now the Cobb County Cold Case Unit is armed with new DNA evidence, which is allowing them to take a new look at the case. And tonight, our investigator, Rebecca Lindstrom, teams up with a graphic artist to show us how Debbie Lynn Randall tragically died from a new perspective. Parents raped by telephone. Debbie Lynn Randall's father still has every newspaper article written about her disappearance. Clue still lacking in Deborah's slaying. He even has the front page picture of his little girl's body being carried out of the woods. She was only nine years old. But it tears you up. Literally tears you up. 
This is where Debbie Lynn was last seen alive. Today, it's a bus terminal. But we hired a graphic artist to help us understand what it looked like on January 13th, 1972. At that time, Debbie Lynn's family lived in an apartment complex on one side of the street, and the laundromat where she was abducted sat on the other. I think it was like 57 feet from her front door to the laundromat. 57 feet was all Debbie Lynn's kidnapper needed. Her mother found the box of soap she tried to bring home scattered on the ground. Debbie Lynn loved dolls, and since this is her story, that is how we portray her. I don't know that I'll ever look at a Barbie doll again that I don't think about her. Detective Morris Nix, a volunteer with the Cobb County Cold Case Unit, says a man in a dark 1950s pickup grabbed Debbie and forced her into his truck. There was an eyewitness. She, I know she was kicking and screaming. Sandra Walker was 12 years old at the time. She didn't want to talk on camera, but says she remembers almost getting run over by the man as he sped away. And she says she can still feel his eyes looking back at her through the rearview mirror. Debbie Lynn was found 16 days later during a mass search of the woods. Police say Debbie Lynn had been found raped and suffocated. The killer likely using her own coat to muffle her screams. I still think that it's possible to solve this case. Marietta police had preserved the evidence well, and for the first time, investigators have a DNA profile. The suspect, a white male. I don't know. Thank you, Adam. Debbie Lynn's father has no words for the man that killed his daughter, but overflows with emotion, knowing she has not been forgotten. I loved her. I always love her. We're actually using that artwork to create a graphic novel, The Doll and the Monster. And you can see for yourself by going on to 11alive.com or looking for the story in the 11 Alive app. Police say the new DNA evidence has helped them rule out several suspects, but what they need now